My sermon today is going to be from uh, the, uh, the, the last chapter of Luke, Luke chapter 24. We're going to be uh, reading um, a longer passage perhaps than normal, but it's the whole passage uh, is, is about these two guys who are on the road to another town and they meet Jesus. So we're going to pick up in verse uh, 13 of chapter 24 in Luke. Now, on that same day, uh, that is uh, the day Jesus resurrected, okay? This is the, the context of this passage is Jesus has just resurrected. Uh, the, the women have already found the, the tomb empty. They've gone. They've told their, their friends. They've come back. There's nobody at the tomb. So we pick up that same day. Two of them, the disciples, were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all the things that had happened. While they were walking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, what things? The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty indeed, and word before God and all the people. How our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that, he had, or that they had seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he, this is Jesus, said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us. It is almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them. And when their eyes were open, they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while we were talking, while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? In that same hour, they got up and returned to Jerusalem. They found the eleven and their companions gathered together, and they were saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. And then these men told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. One of my favorite jokes goes like this. Lois Lane and Clark Kent are sitting at the table eating dinner out at a restaurant. They're glancing down at their menus, trying to figure out what they want to eat. When Lois says, you'll never guess who I saw the other day at work. Clark Kent lowers his glasses to say, who? And she yells, oh my gosh, it's Superman. Because he pulls his glasses down and she can recognize him as Superman. That's all Clark Kent ever did to, to, to cover himself as Superman. As a kid, I thought, really? Nobody recognizes Superman when he puts glasses on? Like, look, I'm a glasses wearer. You don't know that, perhaps. Nobody recognizes Superman just because he wears some glasses? 
And then, of course, I do something like shave my beard off. And people don't recognize me. <laughs> and I think, well, maybe it is as easy as a, as a beard or some glasses. Junia keeps coming up to me and go, you took your beard off? Like, I think she thinks it's in my drawer somewhere. <laughs> we aren't told why these two guys don't recognize Jesus, except that he was hidden from their eyes, right? That's all Luke tells us. Their eyes were kept from recognizing him. We don't know. Maybe Jesus rolls up without a beard, right? Maybe Jesus rolls up and he's wearing glasses this time. And like Clark Kent, we don't recognize him. We aren't told exactly why these men don't recognize Jesus. All we are told is that they don't. Why? I mean, this feels like a weird thing. Why would Jesus hide himself from these two people? Why? Oh, I, here's the thing. So seven miles. I, I, I went on Google Maps and I was trying to figure out how far that would be. If you left Westwood Christian Church and walked all the way through downtown to Monona, to the Old Brick Gardens, that's seven miles. If you left Westwood and walked all the way, you know, south, southwest to Epic in Verona, that's just under seven miles. That's a long way to walk with somebody. That's a long way to go to not recognize Jesus, I would think. Even after he reprimands them, he scolds them in the middle of their walk, right? Oh, how foolish you are. Now, uh, some commentators think that uh, this might be kind of a, an old uh, kind of Greek euphemism that to us might be like, you silly goose. Like that might be what, what Jesus is saying to these people, but we're not really sure. Regardless, he says, how could you not know? Now, we know that these two are not, you know, they're not part of the 12. They're part of the extended group of disciples, right? And, and I've always wondered, is Cleopas happy that his name gets mentioned? Or would he rather be anonymous like the other guy who doesn't have to get made fun of for not knowing who Jesus is for all of eternity? I don't know. But they go seven miles with this guy. And they go, how do you not know what just happened three days ago? Like, it was all over. All the newspapers were talking about it. Everybody has been talking about the three guys who were killed on Golgotha. And then some of our friends today found that the, one of the tombs was empty. How do you not know? And then Jesus, we're told, from Moses through the prophets, interprets all the scriptures. And they still don't recognize him. They still don't see who this guy is. Until what? Until they get back to their house. Or at least where they're about to stay. It's, it's dark. Evening is coming. They retreat into a house. And there's bread on the table. And Jesus does for them what he's done before. He takes the bread. He gives thanks. He blesses it. He breaks it. And he gives it to them. And in that moment, their eyes are opened. Now, it is my belief that this is not just Jesus saying grace before dinner. This is a way for Luke to tell us that, that Jesus is doing the same kind of thing he did at the Last Supper. It's, the, it's, it's three of the four same words. He took, the, in, 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 Luke, um, in Luke 22, when he institutes the Lord's Supper, in verse 20, uh, sorry, in verse 19, he took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. That verse and the verse in, in our passage today in Luke chapter 24 have three of, the four, three of the four same words. The only word that's different is that in, in, in the Last Supper, Jesus is said to give thanks, whereas here in our passage today, the word that is used there is blessed it. 
Perhaps the difference being that the night before he was betrayed, he hadn't died yet, and he has now. Regardless, it's three of the four same words, and our Bibles often struggle to translate that give thanks and bless to make them sound different. Perhaps you heard today the translation I have, the NIV, they all translate them the same way. We're supposed to hear communion. We're supposed to hear Eucharist. We're supposed to hear the Lord's Supper. We're supposed to hear whatever you want to call this table that we'll celebrate later. That's what we're supposed to hear in this. This is the defining characteristic of Jesus' ministry with these people is that he gives them a meal that they're supposed to eat. In fact, part of the reason that I think Jesus did this a lot, even though our, our, our Bibles only give it to us a couple times, is that in the book of John, we see Jesus talk about some communion kind of language, eat my, eat my uh, body, drink my blood. He does that right after feeding the 5,000 in John chapter 6. It seems to me that this language where Jesus would take bread and break it and give thanks and give to his disciples, this was something he did all the time. So it's no wonder that that's the moment where these two people recognize Jesus. This is his thing. This is, this is Jesus' moment with his disciples. This is the moment. And then we're just told that he disappears. He vanishes from their sight. Like imagine someone hands you bread and then poof, they're gone. Like that's what we're told happens here. And they're so astounded. Remember, they think he's still dead because they've only heard stories about Jesus being resurrected. These two guys haven't seen him yet. So what do they do? They immediately, that same hour, supposedly they eat, you know, they had their meal. And then they run back to Jerusalem. Right? They've spent all day walking with Jesus. And then they're like, nah, man, we, we got to run back. Like, we got to go tell our friends about this. We got to go tell them that he's appeared to us too. They're so moved by this moment with Jesus where I love that it is the breaking of their bread where everything clicks into place. Which tells me that the table is the place where strangers become friends. The table is the place where Jesus reveals himself to his own followers. You know, it's interesting to me that the two things Jesus gives the church to do, the two things that Jesus gives the church to do are personal and intimate and messy. What do I mean? There are two things, right? In our churches, we like to call them ordinances because the word sacrament's not in the Bible, so we use a different word that's not in the Bible to describe them. <laughs> call them the ordinances or the sacrament of communion and baptism. Those are the two sacraments or ordinances that we claim Jesus gave the church. And what are they? I mean, at their core, we're talking about bath and dinner. Those, those are personal. Those are up close. Those are intimate. Right? I mean, make no mistake. The one thing that Jesus tells his disciples to do when they gather is eat. Jesus does not prescribe a worship service. As mind-blowing as that may be. Jesus does not say, gather on the first day, sing songs to me or about me, hear a sermon. That's not what Jesus says. He says, do this as often as you gather in remembrance of me about communion. This is the reason that communion for our churches is such a big deal. We do it every week because we're gathered together. This is what they were doing. This is what the New Testament church was doing when they got together. Remember, they're meeting on Sunday, 
first day of the week. And so for some of these people, you know, the five-day work week is not a thing yet. So they're going to work, working in the market or in the farm or wherever from the morning into the evening. And they're gathering with the community of faith to eat and drink in remembrance of Jesus. This is why in 1 Corinthians, Paul has to tell the rich people who don't have to work on Monday or on Sunday, stop eating all the food because <laughs> they're overindulging and other people can't eat when they come to celebrate Jesus. In, in Acts chapter 2, right after we have the first converts added to the church, we are told that day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Again, they, they were breaking bread. In Luke, and Luke wrote the book of Acts too, this is, this is a way that he is communicating. They broke bread at the Lord's table. They're doing what Jesus told them to do. And they're doing it daily, <laughs> apparently, day by day. They gather in the temple, then they go to somebody's house, and they eat, and they drink, and they experience life together. It's so interesting to me that the thing that Jesus prescribes for us is a meal. I mean, meals are messy, they are unorganized, they are loud, things don't go according to plan. If you're eating with my children, something's getting spilled. Plates or glasses are being broken and things are happening. People are talking, people are enjoying one another's company. Undoubtedly, someone's getting a stain on their shirt from something. Jesus did not prescribe a seamless, perfectly put together anything. We didn't coordinate having some mess ups today. That would have been funny. But today's a reminder that it's not about us being perfect. I can't think of anything that feels more like a meal than someone going, oops, let me start again. I can't think of anything more like a meal than someone telling a joke that nobody laughs at. I think it's interesting. I think it's important. I think it's absolutely foundational that what Jesus tells his followers to do is spend time with each other in some of the moments where you are at your most vulnerable. Why do we go on dates to have meals together? Right? I mean, for, for many people, your first date with someone is a meal. A place of vulnerability and transparency and intimacy. You get to see, do they chew with their mouth open? Do they talk with their mouth full? Do they spit food at me while they're talking? I mean, these are big, important things, right? Were they raised in a barn or not? And that's what Jesus prescribes for the disciples. A meal. But not just any meal, a meal of eternal significance, right? Jesus says that this is my body. <laughs> this is my blood. I mean, these are not just bread and wine. These are not just things, he says. And do I pretend to understand how any of that works? No. I don't. But again, I will say that I think it is, it is around a table that strangers become friends. One of the things that I love doing as a minister 
is eating with people. Because it's a place where I get to say, tell me about yourself. Why are you living in Madison? Tell me about your family. Tell me about what you're going through right now. And by the way, here's me. I chew with my mouth full, open sometimes. I'm sorry. Sometimes I get too excited and I'm loud. I'm sorry. But at the table, strangers become friends. And this right here is the defining moment of weekly church observance. That all of us at this table can become friends when we walked in as strangers. One of the things that I love about communion is the way that it absolutely binds us to churches and Christians all over, not just the world, but throughout time. Maybe this is just the science fiction nerd in me. But there's something incredible when I think about when I eat and drink at communion, if I'm being joined at Christ's table, then so too, as we said earlier, are all the great many people who have come before us and the great many people who will come after us. Those names that are written on the back of our bulletin who are now eating and drinking at a, at a much, more real, much more real presence table than I get to. I get to think about all the people who have gone before. All the people who were part of this church who I get to eat and drink with. I'm a, I'm a transient person. Born in central Illinois, raised in eastern Wisconsin, went to Tennessee for college, went to New Hampshire for ministry after that, and then moved back here. I know lots of people all over the country. And yet, when I eat and drink with them, we become linked once again. This right here is why community, fellowship, is one of our values as a church. Because Christ gave us something that we do together. He gave us something that draws us in to each other and to him. We know that the, the Christian life is not meant to be done alone. It's not something I'm supposed to do on my own. The lie of modernity is that I can achieve what I want to if I set my mind to it. first place it's put back together when we join with one another when we become friends and not just friends but how does Jesus and how does Paul describe the church as a family we're described as brothers and sisters right the passage that we read earlier today, we have but one Father, right? The God and Father of all. So community here is a big part. And not just because we like each other. I mean, we do like each other, right? I hope. We do like each other. We do like food. Those are all good things. But it's not just because we like each other. It's because foundational to our growth as a Christian, foundational to our fellowship with Jesus, is this idea that we are not in it alone, that we are in it together, that we are there for and with each other. One of... Um, so Andy Stanley, who's a pastor down in, um, in Georgia, 20 years ago, I think, he said, the church happens best in circles, not in rows. And his point was, and if you've been to North Point or if you know North Point, they've got thousands of people who come to their church on Sunday. And it's hard for thousands of people to get to know each other. And so their point was, we want you involved in a small group, a microcosm of community of our church. Because at some point, we want you to know that you are not in this alone. And hear me say, I think he's right. 
You see, Jesus did not say, gather together on a Sunday and sit in rows and everybody look one direction and listen to one guy talk. What he said was, gather around a table and eat and drink. Do this in remembrance of me. Now, I, I, I hear me say that one of my goals for the next year, one of my goals for the next year is to help us develop and help people get involved in small groups of community. It's one of my goals for the next year. In order to have small groups, we need small group leaders. That's how that works. There's a card. I think there's one card per row. We've got more cards in the lobby, but you can also just use a connect card if you want. If you're interested in talking more about facilitating, that's all I need you to do, facilitating a group of people who enjoy time with each other, I would love to talk with you about that. I will train you. I will support you. I will give you what you need. Now, we've got a couple small groups that are already happening, which is great. We have a Sunday school class that happens here on Sunday mornings. That's great. But what, are, are there other opportunities where we could do that? I'd love to talk with you about that. I'd love to talk with you about joining or leading a small group. That's the big picture. Today, we're going to do communion a little bit differently than we normally do it. We're going to take communion together. And we're going to do it a little less formally. Evan and Christopher, can I get you two to come help me with these communion trays? You're good, David. We're going to leave one here. Can you put one of these communion trays on that table over there and one on the table over there? There's a table over on that wall, a table over there. Here in a moment, I'm going to pray. But here's what we're going to do for communion today. Lauren's going to play some, some music kind of quietly. I invite you to get up and walk to one of our three communion stations. We have gluten-free bread up here if you need that. I invite you to take a piece of bread and take a cup of juice and bring that back to your chair and we'll eat and drink together. But here's why we're getting up and moving. Okay, It's not just for calisthenics. It's because what I want you to do on your way to pick it up so I want you to pass the peace. I want you to tell somebody it's good to see you. I want you to shake a hand or give a hug. Because we're family, we're told. Now, if you need help, if you're not able to you know, get up and get communion, let me know or let one of our guys know. We'll help you get communion. Or let somebody know. Say, hey, I, I need help. I can't think of anything more like a family than helping one another. Now, I forgot one thing I meant to say earlier about how we as a church are going to foster community. I'm going to try something kind of radical. It feels radical to me. Maybe it's not to you. This year for Thanksgiving, my family, we're going to have Thanksgiving here at the church. Anybody who wants to join us, we'd love for you to join us for Thanksgiving. Anybody who wants to come in, bring a meal, bring a side dish, just let us know so we can make sure we have enough turkey for everybody. We're going to have Thanksgiving at the church. We're going to eat together day by day. We're going to foster some community, and we'd love for you to join us. Might be weird the first time. I don't know. Well, I'm here for it. With that said, I'm going to pray, and then I invite you to get up at your leisure, say hello, pass the peace, grab communion, and return to your chair. And once everybody has communion, we will eat and drink together. God in heaven, I thank you. I thank you, Lord, for giving us a family. Because some of us, we prefer to go alone, but we know that that's not the best. God, I pray that you would help us foster community, help us foster fellowship, help us foster opportunities to gather together. Because in gathering, we bear witness to you. 
in gathering, we see you as you reveal yourself to us. God, I pray that you would bless this meal that was given to us as a proclamation of the good news of Jesus. It is in his holy name we pray. Amen.